Hey everyone, it's Sarah with RegisterNurseRN.com and in this video, I'm gonna be going over part two of myocardial infarction. In this video, I'm gonna be covering the nursing interventions and the medications given in this condition. Now be sure to watch part one because that video builds upon this video where I cover the patho, the anatomy, how it's diagnosed, reading an EKG, and things like that. And as always, over here on the side or in the description below, you can access the quiz, the lecture notes, and part one, and the other videos in the NCLEX Cardiac series. So let's get started. First, let's talk about nursing interventions. What are you gonna be doing for this patient as the nurse? Remember, time is muscle. We talked about in part one, those cells in the heart, when they quit receiving blood, they die really fast. And within 30 minutes, it, it's irreversible. We can't fix them. And once they're gone, they are gone. They cannot be replaced. So as a nurse, we wanna make sure we're assessing our patients and we're acting fast. Okay, so we will assess our patients for chest pain. A lot of times patients will tell you if they're having chest pain or if they're there for cardiac issues, you need to always assess them for chest pain because some patients may not tell you. And take steps to evaluate it. Hospitals have protocols, what you do for whenever a patient has chest pain. So typically what you're gonna do is you're going to start assessing the cardiovascular system. You're gonna get a 12 lead EKG per physician's order. And your job as the nurse is to get that EKG and to look at it. In the previous video, that's why I really want you to watch it, I talked about how to read these EKGs as a nurse, what we need to know to do our job, the different areas it reflects in the heart and what you're looking for. Because you're looking for ST segment elevation or depression, you're looking at those T waves, are they hyperacute, are they inverted, and you're looking for pathological Q waves. So watch that video to figure out how to look at those things. Another thing is, you wanna put them on continuous bedside monitoring because they are at risk for going into life-threatening um, dysrhythmias like V-fib, VTAC, things like that. Also, dysrhythmias like atrial arrhythmias or AV blocks. You want to monitor their blood pressure, their heart rate, again, look for those dysrhythmias. Place them on oxygen nasal cannula as ordered by the physician. It's usually two to four liters, whatever the physician orders. Um, have a working IV. Make sure that you have um, at least one for sure, and if you can get multiple IVs. Typically, um, you'll probably, you may be starting them on drips and you'll need another IV to give them other IV push medications. So make sure you have working IV site. Monitor the respiratory sounds, because as we talked about in the previous video, we talked about complications from an MI. You wanna make sure that they're not having crackles or also called rails, which could represent that, that we're having some heart failure problems. We have some pump failure going on because that heart muscle has died, so that blood is backing up into those lungs. Fluid overload, so listen to that. Strict bed rest. I can tell you that is a for sure thing. Do not let your patients get up who are having chest pain because getting up while having chest pain will increase that chest pain and make it worse. A lot of patients wanna get up, move, pace the floor. They're very anxious, they're very scared. They may need to use the bathroom. Um, you need to get men a urinal or a bedside commode for women because moving around is gonna put extra stress on that heart and we don't want to do that. Uh, you're gonna collect cardiac enzymes as ordered by the physician. Again, we talked about those. Usually that includes troponin levels for sure, maybe some CKMB, things like that. And a big part of our job is that we're gonna be administering medications that the doctor has ordered. So as a nurse, with medications, this is what you wanna be familiar with whenever we start going over this in the lecture. The side effects of the medications, how the patient should respond. You need to evaluate, is the patient responding appropriately? Is this what we want? Patient education, where are you gonna educate the patient on? Because a lot of times they'll be going home on these medications to manage this condition. How they work on the body and the typical medic medications given for an MI. So what medications are used to treat a patient experiencing a myocardial infarction? To help you remember this, remember this mnemonic to help you remember the categories of drugs. Acute angina means nasty artery blockages and cardiac complications. The first drug category is anticoagulants. This will include antithrombotics and antiplatelets. First, let's talk about antithrombotics. This will include 
Lovenox and heparin, these are one of the most popular ones used in the hospital setting. What, how do they work? They prevent clot formation because remember when we talked in part one about the patho of how these little coronary arteries can become blocked, remember um, there was rupture of a plaque, all those um, clotting factors went there to form a thrombus and that actually caused more problems because it blocked the blood supply even more to this heart muscle. So this will prevent any further myocardial infarctions from happening. So Lovenox, this is usually given as a sub-Q injection. As the nurse, because it um, decreases formation of clots, you gotta watch the patient for bleeding. You'll want to assess their gums, make sure they don't have any bleeding on gums. Their stool, is it dark and tarry? Are they having a GI bleed? Um, watch their urine, is it turning light pink? They may have be bleeding in the kidneys. Or is there a drop in blood pressure and an increase of heart rate? You don't see the bleeding actively, maybe it's inside the body somewhere, but a low blood pressure, hypotension, and tachycardia represents that they're bleeding out. Another drug use is called heparin. A lot of times you will be starting a heparin drip or be given a sub-Q injection, depending on whatever the physician wants. Again, you'll be monitoring them for bleeding as well, but as the nurse, it's very important that you are watching their platelet levels. A lot of times, um, CBCs will be ordered and platelets will be on there and you wanna make sure that they're not dropping because if the patient has been on heparin for several days, you may notice a significant drop in platelets. And I have seen this happen, so this really, really does happen and patients develop this. And it's known as heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, also called HIT HIP. And what will happen is that you will see those platelets drop less than 150,000. Typically, if this happens, heparin will be discontinued and the physician may switch them to Argatraban or Angiomax. Those are medications used for patients who have heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Now, whenever a patient is on heparin, what's your role? You're gonna monitor for bleeding, of course, and you'll be collecting, or lab will be collecting, full body will be collecting a PTT. This is called a partial thromboplastin time. This is um, the amount of seconds it's taking for the patient to um, form a clot. A normal PTT is 25 to 35 seconds. However, whenever we have them on heparin, we wanna delay that a little bit. Remember, because that's the whole purpose of this is prevent clot formation. So depending on whatever your facility lab is, a therapeutic heparin PTT is generally 60 to 80 seconds long. The next A part of our mnemonic is antiplatelets. Antiplatelets work by decreasing platelet aggregation and thrombus formation. Some popular ones are aspirin and Plavix. Aspirin, how does that work? It's usually prescribed in a low dose and it decreases the clot from forming. So hence another MI, just in case another plaque ruptured, um, it would decrease those platelets from aggregating at that site of injury. However, with this, you have to watch out for GI bleeding. Patients who've had a history of that are definitely at risk for developing it again with aspirin. Another thing is Plavix. A lot of patient times this is prescribed if the patient can't take aspirin, they can't tolerate it. However, with this, as the nurse, remember this, they can develop a complication known as thrombotic thrombocytopenia purpura. Uh, we'll call it TTP. And this is where clots form in vessels, little vessels, and decreases the blood flow to the tiny, uh, to vital organs. So as the nurse, you may see decreased platelets. The patient may all of a sudden have neuro changes, renal failure. They may have a fever, anemia, or bruising. So it's very important that you educate the patient that if you notice, you start getting really confused, you're having a fever, renal problems, you can't pee, things like that, they need to report that because they could be entering into this. Another thing, another part of education is if the patient is scheduled for a surgical procedure that they need to let their surgeon know that they take Plavix because it takes a while for the body to clear Plavix, up to five to seven days. So it's not something that you can just stop the day before surgery. They would have to stop it and be placed on something else. Okay, another part of our mnemonic, the M, Morphine, this is prescribed a lot of times in the acute situations when your patient's having chest pain. A lot of times nitroglycerin you will find is not even relieving their pain. Nitro is not working. Remember that was one of those signs and symptoms that we talked about in part one. But the morphine helps. 
This is usually given IV route. However, watch for hypotension, lowering that blood pressure, and respiratory depression. Next, in for nitrates. This includes nitroglycerin. A lot of times this can be given as an ointment, a sublingual, tablet underneath the tongue, IV, like in a drip, or transdermal with a patch. And how this works is it vasodilates those coronary arteries. And this causes increased blood flow to the heart. So if you have some ischemia going on, you give some nitro, you open up those coronary arteries, hopefully some blood can get to those myocytes that are being deprived of nutrients. However, with this, you got to monitor their blood pressure. This can cause a massive drop in blood pressure. Um, also assess their chest pain. If they're on a drip, you'll need to titrate the drip based on their chest pain and their vital signs. Watch their EKG and have continuous bedside monitoring while they're on a drip. Side effects of this medication includes a headache because you have vasodilation, all that blood is just pumping to that head. So teach the patient that you'll probably get a headache also, you may feel warm or flushing or dizzy. Next, A for ACE inhibitors, which stands for angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. And these typically end in pril, P-R-I-L. One uses lisinopril. And this works by blocking the conversion of angiotensin one to angiotensin two, which causes vasodilation, drops the blood pressure, and decreases the workload on the heart. However, a side effect from this medication is that the patient could develop a dry dry nagging cough where literally they cough every like five minutes. It bothers them and they may not be able to tolerate this. Also, uh, these drugs can increase the potassium level. So educate your, educate your patient about watching how much potassium they take in through their diet. And how it does this is because this decreases aldosterone in the body which causes the body to retain potassium and excrete sodium. So that's why you get hyperkalemia. Next, B for beta blockers. Some use like Coreg, Low Presser, that's the brand name. The generic names end in O-L-O-L. -O -O -L. And they work by decreasing the workload on the heart. You will get a slower heart rate and a slower blood pressure, lower blood pressure. As a nurse, you want to monitor their heart rate, make sure it's staying within 60 to 100. Um, what you need to educate your patients, especially if they're diabetic, these beta blockers can mask the symptoms of hypoglycemia, which includes the tachycardia, hence with beta blockers, you're not gonna get tachycardia, or the sweating. So let your um, diabetic patients know that because they need to monitor their blood sugar more closely. Also, with patients with COPD or asthma, they may not be a candidate for beta blockers because they can cause um, bronchospasms problems with that. And not to take these beta blockers with grapefruit juice because grapefruit juice decreases the absorption of the beta blocker. Next A for ARBs, this stands for angiotensin receptor blockers. Also, they end in sartan, S-A-R-T-A-N. Um, for instance, like losartan. These are typically used in place of ACE inhibitors. If the patient can't tolerate the ACE inhibitors, maybe due to that nagging cough, they'll be placed on this. And it works by blocking angiotensin II. So um, you get vasodilation. However, side effects of this is an increased potassium level, just like the ACE inhibitors. However, you don't get the dry nagging cough. Next, for the C, for cholesterol lowering medications. A lot of times patients have high cholesterol levels. That's why they developed a myocardial infarction because they got atherosclerotic sclerotic, and the plaque ruptured. So they maybe started on a statin to decrease the ADL level like Lipitor. So this works by lowering LDL, which is your bad cholesterol, uh, lowers your lower total cholesterol, your triglycerides, and helps to increase your HDL, which is your good cholesterol. Um, educate the patient that this is not to replace diet and exercise just because they're taking a um, cholesterol medication and to notify the doctor if they develop muscle pain because statins can um, cause muscle issues. Also, as the nurse, you'll be monitoring if the doctor orders a CPK level to um, monitor if there is muscle damage because this will increase if there is muscle injury due to a statin causing it. Also, you'll be monitoring liver function because this drug works by acting in the liver to decrease cholesterol level. So we wanna make sure our liver is functioning good. 
The last uh, C part of the mnemonic is calcium channel blockers. Sometimes this is ordered, um, maybe Norvas, Cardizam, one of the other calcium channel blockers, and this works by stopping transport of calcium to the myocardial muscle or in smooth muscle. So whenever this happens, you get vasodilation of those coronary arteries that sit on the heart that feed it blood supply. So as a nurse, you want to monitor for hy hypotension, monitor their heart rate, and also educate the patient because you get more blood flow. For some reason, this drug causes um, hyperplasia of the gum, so you get enlargement of the gum, so they'll want to have good oral hygiene while taking a calcium channel blocker. Okay, so that is part two of myocardial infarction. Be, be sure to check out part one, and don't forget to take the quiz, and thank you so much for watching, and please consider subscribing to this YouTube channel.